ortho surgery. We've got a party. We're just going to get on, do this. I'm not scaring. Get you all sorted. Oh. John. 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 Do you remember where you are? King's College Hospital, <laughs> London. Thank God, thank God. A major trauma centre. Hit the curb, jackknifed onto the verge. Have we got a good pulse? Have we got an output? You know? One of the busiest a &E ones in the world. He will probably scream, but he won't remember. No, stop! Ah! A place where love. Come on, sir. Let's go. Up you go. No, no, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. There you go. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> and loss. It's, it's all right. Unfold every single day. Ah! Don't cry. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll make sure we'll right. mummy stays okay. with you. Okay. Well, listen. Right, who's not busy? Squeeze that. We can't give up. I know. Come on. We've got to be strong for mum. If it is the last bit, hey. All the patients you're about to see were treated in one department. Oh! Well done. In just one 24-hour period. I never cease to be amazed at the robustness of human beings. I love you. And the strength of their relationships. Love, it's a reflex. It's what you do. For many of the families, despite the devastation that they may be facing, they give unconditional love. a bit too long now. I wonder who they belong to. I'm better now. Mummy is nice. Is nice. Is nice. I'll be right back, okay? When I was just a little girl, then I spoke to what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. I like working with children. Could be a future or anything in that room, can't they? That's the great thing about it. It's like when you're at school, you could look at who might be the next prime minister and who could be the next Marilyn Monroe. What were you like as a child? I think I was cheeky and a little bit rebellious rather than, um, you know, criminal. If you'd have asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I'd have wanted to be a fairy or a mermaid. I thought I wanted to be a hairdresser, but the odd occasion in high school when I've cut a friend's hair, it's probably a really good thing that I changed my mind because <laughs> I'm not very good at it. I want to be a fireman, I think. Although I can't go up ladders, so that was that was out. And then a policeman, I think, the second one. Truthfully, I wanted to be a car mechanic. The fact that I could come home absolutely head to toe in Greece was my idea of heaven. What were you like as a teenager? God, you don't want to know. Awful. <laughs> yeah, I was quite wild. Any stories? Oh, uh, no, probably not. <laughs> I was quite boring. I wasn't particularly wild. I didn't particularly rebel. You know, when I got to sort of 16, I started going out. And when I got to 17, started to notice a sort of ongoing headache. It's a weird thing to to describe, I call it my tumour headache because I don't have really the words to describe it. Just sort of like a hot poker searing through your head. Just really quick, short bursts. And then it would go and I'd think, okay. 
it was a bad hangover. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was way more than your average headache. Sarah is 35. That's so I'll stick it all in here. Sorry. She's had a headache for the last four days. Okay. Oh. Get that. Sorry. Not my day. Let's get you sorted out, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Hi. Hi there. My name's Ollie. I'm one of the A and E doctors. Tell me about the headache. Um I'm sure it's nothing. I've had a virus, so maybe it's that. But I've had three brain tumours in the past. Mm. I was 17 when I had the first one. And then three years later, the second one, well, it was the first one that recurred. Why didn't you come in on Friday when the headache started? I'm very much, <laughs> I guess it's just the person that I am. I, I worry just in case it is something really bad and stupidly I don't with my second Second tumour, I knew, I knew for a good week that it was back. Mm. That, uh, I went as far as Heathrow Airport to go to Australia before. Is it a little bit la 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 la? Yeah. I've always been told it won't come back and then it has three times and various complications. That's fine. And it's just this, yeah. You are a VIP when it comes to head and brain related concerns. My job is to assume the worst yeah. for everyone, all right? Okay. Doesn't necessarily mean anything to be worried about, mm -hmm. but you're here yeah. and you, with your track record, we have to assume the worst and hope for the best, right. all right? Okay. When you're 17, you're almost untouchable. You don't feel that much can affect you. Can I just put that on? But you're all less aware of the reality of things. We have a saying in our family, if it's unlikely to happen, it will happen to me. So, which is why. My parents put on a brave face. I can see how distraught they were. You know, you, you as a parent, you all you hope is that your children are healthy and happy. And when something goes wrong where they're not healthy, all you want to do is put yourself in their shoes and take it away from them and be the one going through it. And I guess as parents, they felt very helpless and um, I could see that. So I sort of made a vow to myself then that I would do as much as I could to never let them know how I was feeling. I thought if there was something I could do for them, it would be to put on a brave face, put on a smile and just not ever let them see how upset or how scared or how worried I was. Okay. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Because I've spent so long you know, pretending that everything's fine, everything's okay. It's sort of a role you become used to playing and, and then it doesn't become a role anymore, it just becomes who you are and how you deal with things. Yes, I used to want to have five children, but I um, I think my partner might have something to say about that when he's probably slitting his wrists. As long as I get my little girl, then I'm all right. Yes. It would have been quite nice to have had a girl. I think uh, probably each time I, if I, you know, before they were born, if if I been able to choose I might have chosen to have a girl but you know the whole thing to do with motherhood is, is often quite mixed emotions isn't it here why don't you sit down <coughs> sit down darling sit down oh precious love Helen is 47 she's brought in her 10 month old son James 
I have two boys already. Ben's 15, Joe's 12, but I think I always wanted a third child. I think three is a nice number. But I think um, Mark, who is the boy's father, um, was not very keen, actually. Um, so that was always a little bit of an issue. I think Mark and I split up and um, then in due course Pat came along and then it seemed to be the right time because he uh, didn't have any children of his own and he was, you know, very keen and very happy. But of course by then I was a bit older so um, we thought that the IVF route would be the best one to take. Do you want to come through? Yes, that's lovely, thank you. Come along, the tiny man. James was conceived on the third attempt. Shall we sit here? Uh, I'm Ella. Hello, I'm Helen. Helen, hi. Are you mum? Yes. Okay. And what's the problem? Uh, well, the problem is that James has been vomiting since um, it's about 11 o'clock this morning. And normally I wouldn't be concerned, but he's got an absolutely horrendous medical history. Sorry, let's just start with But he is a bit grumpy. Yes, uh, the medical history is, is long. Okay, <laughs> so, um, start from the beginning. Okay, he was born at 36 weeks, but I had preeclampsia and he only weighed uh, 1.67 kilos. Um, he had a hole in the heart and a multicystic kidney. Okay, has that hole yes, in the heart been repaired? Yes, that's right, yeah. The whole pregnancy was terribly difficult from start to finish. Every time we had a scan, the room would fill up with all these experts and that's never a good thing, is it really, in that circumstance? No. At 18 weeks, they realised that he had only one kidney. Then two or three weeks later, we had a detailed cardiac scan, which showed that he had a hole in his heart. I could have really written a textbook about abnormal pregnancies after after that. So once James came out, you know, I was really thinking, oh, that's going to be fine now, you know, he's going to... Um, I do tend to be on the optimistic side, and he came out, he looked normal, um, and uh, obviously they took him straight away to special care. It was all good, the first couple of weeks, really, and then suddenly, when he was about two weeks old, everything went completely pear-shaped because... Um, because he was so tiny, his fetal circulation didn't switch over. Suddenly he was getting breathless, he was distressed. And then uh, the consultant came to me and basically said that they believed that James wasn't going to make it, he was going to die um, quite soon. And I remember just walking in the corridor and uh, tears just, you know, they just pour down your face. And I met this really nice consultant and I said to him, you know, it looks like James is gonna die. And he just gave me a big hug. And he said to me, you know, where there's life, there's hope. And you have to believe that. And it's such a cliche, you know, you, but you can't imagine how powerful that felt on that particular day. I'm sorry, you don't feel good. By the end of that day, he was maintaining his blood pressure and it's, I look back on it, it's dreamlike. It was, a, it was an experience that you don't forget. Are you a happy boy? Yeah, aren't you? So yes, with that history, you can imagine that I would be very, very protective. There was absolutely no way that I was taking any chances, any more chances with him. Oh, little mannequin, you do look tired, don't you? This is what I'm saying. The longer we stay in here, the more sick people are coming in here, brother. Okay, what you needed, what you needed to try and do, is go to a hospital in Africa. You hate hospitals for the rest. You even set foot in the door. People were dying. 
I'm telling you, like... Yeah, because you come from a different environment, innit? You come from, like, here. When you come from here, it's different. When you're used to treatment here, where if you if you're born there, yeah, <laughs> hospital is a hospital, bro. I'm telling you. But then sometimes it's fair so... to go in the hospital because we had the like local, and he was literally like a quack doctor. He was kicked out of his medical school. Wow. And he took out someone's tooth. Yeah, with a chisel. Hold on. What chisel are you talking about? Then you know them garden, little. You know garden garden them chisel. No, no. You know them. <laughs> No, literally. Uh, no, because we said she's. And then it. he tried to inject someone in the head. <laughs> literally. <laughs> I mean that back in the day treatment, bro. <laughs> no, bro. When the doctors were next, were next to the butchers. Oh my god. And he even like he killed someone. And they oh, spared I'm, him. I remember. Yeah. I remember. I remember, I remember. I remember somebody saying about yeah. when he killed Berna. someone. And he then killed the lady. He killed the um, lady at Kolikunda, and then they spared him because basically they don't have enough money to go to the hospital. Mm. So, how did he kill her again? He gave her a wrong injection, and her daughter was left without no mum. He was a real. He was a quack doctor. I'd never let that man treat me. Never, never, never. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I prefer the NHS. Even if you're dying, go to the hospital. <laughs> no, I do. I prefer the NHS. I don't want to bother people if it's not an emergency. Um, I'm aware of how busy everyone always is in A&E and I feel a bit silly if it's something very stupid or it's something not to worry about and I feel like I've wasted people's time. But um, my parents are more insistent than me, so it's usually after being strong-armed by them that I will go in. Sarah's had a headache for the past four days. Since she was 17, she's had three brain tumours. Something that I question more and more. I don't know whether it's the older I get or possibly the more side effects that occur, is I start to question my identity a lot. Am I the person that I was supposed to be or am meant to be? How much of me is the tumour and how much is the side effects of the tumour versus how much is inherently me? I don't know. Mo Molum had famously a, a brain tumour and she was known as being very wild in politics and would do outrageous things, flashing her bra. And, and when she was told about her tumour and how it could affect behaviour and personality, it was the first time that she broke down and she said, but all this time I've thought that was me and you're telling me it's just a product of the tumour. And I, that really, I suppose, struck a note in me. How much of who I am is defined by the illness and how much of me is still me. Keep your head nice and still. Look at my finger. Follow my finger with your eyes. Tell me if you get any blurring or double vision. Tell me about Sarah. What was she like when she was a little girl? She was a joker. She was the one when we'd go away, suddenly started entertaining people by doing little dances and taking people off from the TV. She, she was, wasn't she? Mm, she was yes. Um, yes. that very quiet. She, she. Was yes, very, it's it's strange. Mm, yeah, there's two opposites in her as yeah. well. Yes, shy as well. But... Can you feel me touching on both sides? Yeah, both sides. Sarah, in some ways, is quite introvert and very deep. When she was younger, before she could speak, it would be hard to know exactly what she was thinking. And mm -hmm. now it's sometimes hard to sort of get her to tell you really what's on her mind or what she's thinking. All my tumour headaches have been frontal. This one was at the back. All of was at the back? All at the, the back, head. yeah. And real throb, 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 mm. where I was holding my head. And on a scale of one to ten, when it came on like that, how bad was it? 
seven, eight. Yeah. And what sort of tumour is it? It was a benign pituitary tumour. Pituitary? Okay, all right, fine. I remember saying to a doctor, do what you want, cut my head open, shave my hair off, put staples in my head, it doesn't bother me. My only thing is I want to be a mum, I desperately want to be a mum at some point, when the time is right. Um, so I didn't want that jeopardised. Pituitary gland is the one that releases all the hormones, so yeah. it does affect your fertility. The damage done to it meant that it wasn't possible to, to naturally conceive. It's now, it's even worse, because I've got a baby now, and I just think, I can't, you know. And the baby's with? <laughs> My dad. Okay. He's never changed a nappy in his life. How old's the baby? He's 10 months. Yeah, he's, he's going to learn. <laughs> he's going to learn very quickly. OK, all right. This is not going to be an in and out of A&E in four hours no. type job. So your dad is going to have to get used to changing nappies relatively rapidly. When you say it's not going to be an in and out job, don't could know I how. be at home tonight? I don't know. My dad can't cope for a night. Okay. Okay, I'll have to make some phone calls. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. These things never happen at convenient times. It's just my, my baby. <laughs> it's your baby, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm fine, I'm fine, don't get teary. No. Right, okay. It was around a time which personally wasn't great for me. I was going through a lot of things. I had to move back home um, with my mum and dad. Press nine for an outside line. Thank okay. You very much. <laughs> Hi, Dad. How is he? What time did he sleep till? Okay. All right. Um, I'm not going to be in and out. It's not a quick job. Um, may not even be back tonight. Well, again, until they do something, they don't know. But um, basically, with my, you know, someone, if somebody, forget my history, if someone had come in and said, this is what's happened, coughing fit, blah, 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 they would assume a small bleed at the back of the brain, like a blood vessel. It might not be, but that's what they would assume. He said, obviously, given my history, yeah. You know, my concerns pre-Elliot used to just be, well, you know, if something happens, then it happens and I'll deal with it. But the minute a child arrives, it suddenly changes your priorities and your perspective. I bet, so, yeah, you're going to have to get Kerry's help or something, Dad. OK. Bye. Cheers. Is it worth even remotely trying to move it in any direction to try and ease it? <laughs> No, not at all, <laughs> not at all. You kind of imagine that there's a certain age where everything becomes simple and, and uh, I remember thinking, you know, when I was like 13, I remember thinking, oh, those 16 year olds, they've got it all sorted out. And I would get to 16, I would just think, and then I'll look at the 18 year olds and it'd be all over again. I'm still doing it. Kings ain't neat. Yep. Outside a South London pub, a young man has been stabbed twice. Some children are quite independent, so they can wander off and go off. He was very clingy um, as a child. Four. Lovely. OK, thanks. Bye. 
usually people who did meet him thought, oh, he's such a lovely boy, he's so polite and he's so this, which was very nice for me. <laughs> but then, you know, when they turn into teenagers, they sort of change. Red phone, four minutes, red phone, four minutes. Has everybody signed in that needs to sign in? He changed so dramatically through those years. So we became more, more sort of, more like strangers. Stabbed twice in the left thigh. Done. Guys. Hand back on. Oh. Um, when we've arrived, there was one wound which is about four centimetres long and actively bleeding. Um, there's a secondary wound which is about one and a half centimetres, not actively bleeding. Hi, Wayne. My name's Emily, one of the doctors. He's going to check you out all over. Can I have a quick look under here? Yeah. Oh, just oh, oh. Doesn't matter what they've done and what you've gone through, you're always going to be protective about them. And here's something happening which you have absolutely no control over. Ah! Ah! Well done. Ah! Well done. Ah! Well done. Well done. Well done. Another sharp I never thought I would ever be stabbed. I remember saying, I never get stabbed. I never get stabbed. And it was like, wow, I have been stabbed there. Do you remember the first time you were arrested? Yeah, I remember. What do you mean, as in, how do you want me to elaborate in that? The... What happened? Well, I remember I took something. I remember running down the roads, running through the park, and then I hid and I got caught <laughs> hiding in the bin. And then I was in the cell and I was, I, I think I remember, I swear I, I cried because I, like, I don't know what have I done. And then they said, you have to phone your mom. And I was like, do I have to phone my mom? Can I phone someone else? I don't want my mom to find out. And I'm thinking, did I phone my mom or did I phone my uncle? I'm not too sure. I think I might have phoned my uncle and my uncle phoned my mom, but my mom found out anyway. And then that was it. It was like, oh, the shame, you know, I felt shamed. But it wasn't, it wasn't like, I don't know. I, what was the problem was, was when I went back out with my friends, I got glorified for it, you know? It's like, wow, <laughs> yeah, did what happened, you know? You got knit, oh, they, they let you go. And it's like, wow, and it was like, it became kind of cool. And obviously you're young and you're naive and you think, well, wow, okay, cool. You know, you were showing off like, yeah, yeah, you know? And then it became a habit. <laughs> One thing I always said to my mum, don't ever blame yourself because you haven't done anything wrong. It was down to me making my own choices. You know, she always gave me the choice to make. I knew right from wrong, to be honest with you. So you could never say it's down to my mum was a bad parent or anything like that. It was all down to me. That's it, I've got to do something now or never. Precious bear. Ten month old James has been vomiting since 11 a.m. His mum, Helen, has brought him in to paediatric A&E. Hello. Oh, look at that smile. Very good. James spent the first 13 weeks of his life in hospital. When James was born, he was so tiny, and I just burst into tears when I saw him. I just felt this horrible sort of guilt that I've done this to you. <laughs> it's all my fault, basically, that you haven't grown properly. That doesn't help. Hang on a minute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hold my hand, darling. 
With that history, you can imagine that I would be very, very protective. And I think just a couple of months prior to that, he'd had another stomach bug, what I thought was a stomach bug. And I'd kept him on the sofa and looked after him and observed him. And in fact, it turned out to be a hernia. And in fact, he'd, he'd had to have further surgery. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I was you know, more, even more neurotic than usual. Let's hope it is a tummy bug. Are you going to have yeah. the rest of your Let's hope okay. it is, sweetie. Yes. Lovely. Okay. Thank I'll you very much. Well, we'll see you in a bit then. Yeah. I guess we should phone Dada, shouldn't we, and tell him. As a parent, all you want is for your children to be happy and healthy. I'm just going to move you ever so slightly. Okay. Right? Just keep very still there for me, Sarah. And you know, Sarah's scan yeah. will show whether her brain tumour has returned. All right, let's begin. Now, I've always said in a weird way, I'm glad I was a person going through it. OK. And not the person watching someone that I loved going through it, because I'm sure it must be ten times more difficult. OK, do you want to chat with the man? Here he is. Talk to Daddy. Say hi to Daddy. <laughs> That's Daddy. I think that was the first time we'd ever been to hospital and it hadn't been something serious. It was, you know, it was really the beginning of not having to worry about him and really the beginning of treating him like a normal baby after everything that happened. I know my mum, my mum you know, suffers a lot from her nerves, I suppose, because as a mother, you know, it hasn't just happened once. You have one tumour and then you're told it's gone and then it comes back a second time and then you're told it's gone and then it comes back a third time and you're told it's gone. Well, you're always expecting the worst. And I think that's what my mum does now. You know, even when things are going great, there's always part of her that is expecting something bad. You know, and I think that's the damage that it's left behind. My feeling at the time was we must be in the best hands they know exactly what to do but the first operation didn't go too well because he told us that it was terribly vascular and it bled quite a lot so he removed what he could and obviously it came back And that second time, they operated again, but this time was a huge operation whereby a skull was open and it was horrendous. It was so frightening, so frightening. And she was very lucky to make it, very lucky. <sighs> and it came back again. It was as if we were going through a nightmare that would never stop. That poor girl. Do you think there'll ever be a time when you won't worry about Sarah's health? No. Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I read an email that my mum had, had written someone to someone once and it was after the second operation. And she said, what have I done? What have I allowed them to do to my daughter? And it's just that horrible moment of clarity, thinking she blames herself. And, you know, she was nothing but amazing and wonderful, but she still blamed herself. So it's, um, yeah, I'm fine. It's OK, it's not a problem. It's partly lying to myself and partly lying to other people. You know, it's not wanting to face if it is back or if something has happened again. Especially now that I am a mum, I just you know, the thought of going through it again whilst I have Elliot is sort of 100 times more scary. Deafness in the last five years. So what was you doing tonight? I was watching Arsenal. 
win. Watching the Arsenal game, you know, we came back Arsenal 3 0, but we never won. Oh. So a double down, eh? Right? <laughs> Why is it really impossible to my mum and my partner stay with me for the night? Uh, no, no. Well. I don't know that. She's, she's not going to be in a good mood right now. So anyone she can be with? Wayne, a 28-year-old glazer, has been brought in after being stabbed twice in his leg. Okay, mate. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give you a tetanus injection. All right, so we've covered everything just as a precaution, all right. My girlfriend phoned me and she was like, oh, where are you? And I said to her, I'm in the pub with my friends. She parked up around the corner from the pub. She came in, I think me and my friends had one more drink or so. And then we left to go to the car where she was parked. It was like down the side of the street. Um, we got into the car. I remember the, the doors closed, the doors opened back up. And then there was a group of guys all around the car. They waved the gun at my girlfriend. They grabbed my girlfriend's bag. I tried to remember holding it, and then one of them hit me in my face. Then I got punched on my leg twice, what I thought was a punch anyway. And then it happened very quick, and then they just ran off. And I remember trying to get out of the car and trying to chase them, and I couldn't run. And I put my hand on my leg like it was like a dead leg. And then as I looked at my hand, there was just blood all over my hand, and then that's when I realised I got stabbed. I felt sad, you know, knowing that, you know, I felt sad for them as well, because it's, it made me think, you know, you, you achieved one thing, a mobile phone, and there was at least five of you, you know, that like, was that like £10 each, like, you know, like, I would never have done something like that in my bad times, but at the same time, it's that how far we've come. It was kind of sad to know that, you know, people going around stabbing people on random sprees, like, Maybe it's the initiation of a gang or something like that, I don't know, but I did feel sorry for them and I felt saddened, if you understand, you know, knowing that I could have been heading that path. Came in with more roles than you had to start so off with, right? <laughs> more stabs from us than from anyone else. Then who's worse than the You have to put up with us as well. <laughs> got to about age of 24 and I realised, you know, like, enough is enough. Excuse me, man. Thank you very much, man. It's all right. Thank you for your help. Now you look after yourself, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was sitting in the police cell. I remember even looking up at the ceiling and seeing a crime stopper's number and thinking, I've read that number too many times and this is not this is not it no more, you know. I'm sick and tired of this. And the police officer saying, hello, Mr. Marisha, how are you doing today? Didn't want any of that no more, to be honest with you. I thought, you know, try to start a new fresh start. So many people do this revolving door thing. Keep getting in trouble, out of trouble, in trouble. And I think he somehow managed to catch himself and say that, you know, I don't need to be doing this anymore. Although it took time, he found himself, I think. He took positive steps, you know. Went back to college, did some, some courses so that he gained some skills so that eventually when some work came along he would be able to be, you know, ready to take on an, a career, really. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the day my mum said to me, she's very proud of me, it almost made me cry. You know, it's like, wow. And I remember I said to my friends, yeah, my mum said to me she was proud of me, you know, it's like, it felt a lot, you know, to hear my mum say, you know, you've come a long way, you know. She let me make my own mistakes and it's made me who I am today, you know. It's made me a better person, you know. I might have gone through it the long way and it took me 10 years, you know, but it's, it's got to that stage where, you know, I've learned who I am.
motherhood is good for learning about the sort of person that you are and what you can give as well, as, an, as a human being as well as a mother. Ah, uh, is that neuroradiology? I'm just trying to chase up a CT scan report uh, for a head CT on a young lady that's come in with a uh, history very suspicious of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I think I pace when I'm worried. I was probably wondering what my dad was doing at home with, with my son and how he was going to change a nappy. I showed him very hurriedly before I left, but um, it was still crossing my mind. I mean, as a mum, you do, don't you? And you just worry anyway. And I'm always with Elliot, so to not be with him was very strange and I just didn't like it. <laughs> OK. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. Good news and bad news. OK. The good news is the scan doesn't show anything apart from the old... Right. ..what's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. The bad news is that means that we need to speak to the medical team about thinking about doing a lumbar puncture. That's supposed to be painful, I know, but... <laughs> as in, if, if there is just nothing wrong, is it still worth doing a lumbar puncture to prove that there's nothing wrong? Um, the scan doesn't pick up all bleeds. Right. OK. All right. But as I say, a negative scan is good news, yeah? Yes. It's just going down the boxes, ticking them off, all right? Okay. First box is ticked, right. The next box, unfortunately, is, is, a, is a fairly big box, mm -hmm. which is lumbar puncture. But okay. we need to decide whether or not we do need to go down that okay. route. All right? All right. Cheers. All right. I'd uh, happily give up all the bad health for a life of good health. But then, in a way, it has made me who I am. If it hadn't happened, would I have my son? I might have other children, but I wouldn't have Elliot. So, in a way, I wouldn't change things. It's in the hands of the doctors and um, in the hands of God. If you believe in God, it, it, all we can do is hope that we'll be lucky and that she, she gets the best doctors and the best medical care and, and they can sort out, um, you know, the things that are wrong with her and keep her alive. That's, what else can we say, really? We can just be here to um, pick up the pieces if, if um, I that, just, that's I just not... sense she'll be all right. She will be all right. Yeah. I believe that little Elliot has brought her a lot of strength. Tell me about Elliot. What's he like? He's just everything. He's everything to me. I can't imagine not having him. I can't imagine what my life was without him. I remember coming back from the hospital with him and it still doesn't feel like it's real. I still kept thinking at any moment I was going to have him snatched away or wake up from a, a most amazing dream and be told that it wasn't real. You know, it's just so much more precious when you've had to fight for it. So, yeah, having come so far to have got him and then for something to happen would be awful. And I know if something happened, it wouldn't be through fighting because I would fight the whole way. Just want to do the best job I can, be a good mum, do right by him. I never really had my dad in my life. I'm not saying that he's not in my life, but growing up, I don't really have any memories of him being in my life. So 
I'm going to make sure that my child has me until the day I pass away. You know, guide her through all the hard times, bad times, support, best friend, everything. Yeah. So that's what I will try to be. I'll try my best. That's all you can do, really. Absolutely fine. Yeah, there's a lot of room for optimism, and I think you have to make the most of what you've got today and, and dream about the future. I think that's what hmm. makes humans, the, you know, the way yes. we are. That you you live for the future as well as and today. You need to dream. Yeah, you, you do. Dream. Everyone needs a dream. Yeah. I dream about Kate Bush, but uh-huh. there you go. <laughs> Falls, people climbing trees, being stupid, people being drunk, falling out of windows. I've only ever been in that sort of state like once, maybe twice. He says he's got a knife on him and he's been really aggressive to us. I've just called the police. Do you know where you are? Um, my guess is a hospital. 